Heroes by Gertrude C. Hopkins In the Story of King Arthur This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russell Newton The Story of King Arthur in Twelve Tales by Winona Caroline Martin Heroes by Gertrude C. Hopkins Small boy is here beside me, quiet just for a space. No laughter imps deride me, a dream look steals to his face. And I know that a pageant of marvel holds that wide eyes stare, wonderful white winged carvels skimming both water and air, weaving of spells by witch fires, waving of wands and chants, the brave prince lost in the pitch mires, the mountain of glass which slants terribly upward ever the maiden wringing her hands, the enchanted sword which will sever the cruel prisoning bands. Heroes throng to the vision, Roland and Oliver, Arthur of sacred mission with the brand Excalibur. The Cid is here, bestriding Babiaca, poorly named, and there in humble hiding, good Alfred hugely shamed. By raiding of the good wife, he burned the cates forsooth, and hero of the wood life, soft steps in Indian youth. The forge of Vulcan's flaring leap Brunhilda's magic flames, while Jack of dauntless daring the towering giant shames. The golden fleece is taken down from the dangerous tree. The walls of Troy are shaken, but his gaze comes back to me. Dear boy, I shall make a prayer to be said by me for you, but the boon that I ask will share, for my heart will rejoice anew. If the vision hall never leave you of actions brave and strong, of lilies that we love and cleave to, of strivings to right the wrong, if, heroes of boyhood discarding, with heroes indeed you replace, knowing and loving and guarding the heritage of the race. Gertrude C. Hopkins Tale One of the Story of King Arthur This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur in Twelve Tales by Winona Carolyn Martin And I saw Mage Merlin, whose vast wit and hundred winters are but as the hands of loyal vassals toiling for their liege. Tennyson's Coming of Arthur After the last story is told, The Passing of Arthur, and the children standing with Sir Belvedere upon the highest crag of the jutting rock see the warrior king pass with the three tall queens in the dusky barge beyond the limits of the world. They, too, wonder, gazing on the splendor of his passing. Though defeated in the last weird battle in the West, yet he was victorious in his ideals, for he became the spiritual king of his race. From the great deep to the great deep he goes, the children hear, but do not quite understand. It is the better for that, because something of the mystery of life and death is awakened in the child. In that, it serves its highest purpose. It helps the child to realize that there are things in life that eye have not seen nor ear heard. And let it not be forgotten that while we use these great stories for formal work, the formal is always the result of the creative. The letter killeth the spirit giveth life. Thus it is that child and teacher leave the low plains of the lesson hearer, and hand in hand walk the upland pastures of the soul. Editor Tale One Merlin and His Prophecies Once, in those dim, far-off times when history fades away and is lost in the mists of tradition, there sat upon the throne of Britain a man named Vortigern. Like many another king of his day, and of later days for that matter, he had no right whatever to the crown, for he had gained it by the betrayal of a trust, and, some believed, by a still darker crime. Constantine, his overlord who had reigned in Britain before him, had at his death committed to this Vortigern, his chief minister, the care of his three sons, Constans, the heir, and his two brothers, Pendragon and Uther. Soon after the king's death, little Constance had mysteriously disappeared, 
then the true friends of the two remaining princes feared for their lives had fled with them across the sea and found refuge for them at the court of france all this however was now many years ago and so long had vortigern's right to rule been unquestioned that he had almost forgotten his crime in the early days of his reign he had indeed fought valiantly against the only enemies that the britons had at that time greatly to fear these were the tall fair-haired blue-eyed saxons who came from beyond the seas led by hengist and horsa but as the years had passed he and his warriors had given themselves up more and more to lives of luxury and idleness so that at last they had been obliged to make a shameful peace with the enemy and the saxons were now gradually becoming masters of the land it so happened therefore that on the day when our story opens king vortigern had gathered his court about him in his capital city of london there to hold a high festival and in feasting and carousing to forget the disgrace of their surrender and the ills of the country suddenly up to the castle gate through the great portal along the wide corridors and into the very banquet hall itself never stopping to dismount rode a breathless messenger to arms sir king to arms he cried waiting for no ceremony pendragon and uther have this day set sail from the coast of france with a mighty army and they have sworn by a great oath to take your life as you took the life of their brother constance then the king remembered and his face went ashen gray he turned to one after another of the men who should have been his mighty warriors and reading in their flabby cheeks and lustreless eyes the story of their slothful living he knew that his cause was well-nigh lost before the fighting began summon my messengers he was able to say at last and when these were brought before him ride into every corner of my kingdom ride and call together the most skilful artificers craftsmen and mechanics for i have a great work for them to do within a week the messengers on their fleet horses had scoured the land so that there stood before the king a hundred of the best workmen that britain could produce now hear my command said he on the plain that lies furthest west in my kingdom build me a tower whose walls shall be so firm as to withstand all assault of catapult and battering ram and have it ready for my retreat within a hundred days or your lives to the last man shall be forfeited the workmen left the presence of the king with fear in their hearts but to such good purpose did they labor that within a few days there began to be visible upon the plain the jagged outlines of the walls that were to enclose that mighty tower then the weary workmen for the first time feeling assured that they could accomplish their task within a hundred days lay down for the night and were soon fast asleep with the first pale glimmer of dawn however they arose ready to return to their labors with renewed energy but what a sight met their eyes the tower lay in ruins the walls had fallen during the night then with the strength of terror they fell upon their task once more when the second morning came they turned their gaze half in hope and half in dread toward the scene of their labors only to have their worst fears confirmed once again lay before them but a heap of ruins we must use larger stones said one we have no time to talk put in a second if our lives are to be spared we must work as we've never worked before so all through the long hours of the day they toiled in silence and in dread until the damage of the night had been repaired only to find when morning came that for the third time their tower had crumbled to the ground this is enchantment they then cried in despair we cannot build the tower let us go throw ourselves before the king to plead for mercy but when vortigern with his guilty conscience heard that word enchantment a greater dread fell upon his heart lead out these useless artificers he thundered and summon my wise men 
and presently the great doors of the throne room were thrown open and one by one in solemn procession trailing their black robes the astrologers the wizards and the magicians of the realm filed in until they stood in a silent semicircle before the king at last vortigern raised his eyes tell me he said gloomily tell me o oh my wise men as you hold in your possession all the secrets of this world and of the other worlds unknown to ordinary mortals tell me i adjure you why my tower of refuge will not stand he ceased and a deep silence fell upon the room wizard turned to astrologer and astrologer to magician for each knew in his heart that he could give no answer to the question of the king at last the oldest man present stepped forward and bowing low began to speak in deep and solemn tones your majesty he said give us we pray you until tomorrow at high noon this night shall the wizards work their spells and astrologers consult the stars in their courses then shall we be able to tell you why your tower will not stand let it be so replied the king but also let it be well understood that if at high noon to-morrow you are still unable to answer your lives shall pay the penalty even as the lives of my workmen shall pay the penalty if they do not raise my tower within the hundred days fail me not my wise men that night far down in the deepest dungeons of the castle the wizards gathered together about a steaming cauldron vainly chanted their incantations and worked their magic spells while on the highest battlements the black-robed astrologers watched the stars from evening until morning but when the day star itself faded from their sight in the paling blue of dawn they were no wiser than at the beginning of their vigil what shall we do they cried to one another in consternation when the two companies of watchers had met to report their failures hush speak low whispered the sage we must pretend it is the only way to save ourselves i have a plan and as they gathered about him he continued you all know the prophecy that a child who never had mortal parents shall soon appear among us and that he shall be able to read more in the stars than the wisest of our astrologers that he shall be a greater magician than the greatest of us and that through him we shall lose our power and pass away ah yes we have heard they answered shaking their white heads mournfully that child continued the sage is living somewhere in britain at this very moment and his name is merlin let us tell the king that his tower to make it stand needs but the blood of this child sprinkled upon its foundations so shall we by the same act save our lives and rid ourselves of one who otherwise will surely work us harm then the wise men bowed their heads and answered you have spoken words of wisdom so at high noon that day when they were once more gathered about the throne they gave their answer seek your majesty they said a child named merlin who never had mortal parents sprinkle his blood upon the foundations of your tower then it will stand until the end of time thereupon the king summoned his messengers and gave the order ride into every town village and hamlet of my kingdom ride and seek this child until you find him but know that if he is not brought to me within ten days your lives shall be forfeited and not yours alone but also the lives of my wise men for giving me useless knowledge and the lives of my workmen for doing useless work ride then out from old london town north and south and east and west up hill and down dale over mountains and across rivers 
rode the king's messengers on their strange quest one day two days three four five six days seven days eight days and when the ninth day came two of them found themselves far from home riding through the street of a tiny hamlet what is the use of seeking further said one for my part i do not believe for all the wise men say that there ever was or ever could be such a child i fear you are right replied his companion we may as well give up the search and flee for our lives as he spoke the last words however the men were obliged to draw rein lest their horses should trample upon a crowd of children who were quarrelling in the narrow street one urchin had just given another a sharp blow across the face whereupon his victim was proceeding to vent his rage in words that immediately arrested the attention of the messengers how dare you strike me he was screaming at the top of his shrill little voice you who came nobody knows from where and who never had a father or mother and in an instant one of the men had slipped from his horse then having seized both boys he drew them aside that he might question them very soon boys and men found themselves the centre of an interested group of villagers each one of whom seemed more anxious than his neighbour to give all the information that he happened to possess on the subject yes his name is merlin said one and he was cast upon our shores by the waves of the sea not at all interrupted another he was brought to our village in the night by evil spirits and so it went but the anxious messengers soon cut short their eloquence if your name is merlin said they to the lad and you do not know who your father and mother are you must come with us it is the command of the king i am quite willing replied the boy with unexpected meekness perhaps he would not be so willing whispered one of the messengers under his breath to his companion if he knew why he is wanted i hear what you say merlin broke in and what is more i know what you mean but just the same i'm willing to go with you to king vortigern in fact i struck the boy knowing what he would say and what you would do so you see i am not afraid and the tenth day after the departure of his couriers the king sat alone in his audience chamber suddenly the great doors were swung wide and a boy wearing the simple dress of a tiller of the soil appeared before him your majesty said he i am merlin the child who never had father or mother you sent for me because your wise men have said that my blood is needed to make your strong tower stand they have told you an untruth because they know nothing about the tower and also because they are my enemies i ask only that you call them together so that i can prove to you that what i say is so then at the astonished king's command the great bell of the castle was tolled and presently the black-robed astrologers wizards and magicians filed once more into the royal presence you may question my wise men now said the king to merlin and save yourself if you can tell us then o prophets of king vortigern cried the boy what lies under the plain where the king has tried to build his tower then the wise ones drew apart that they might take counsel together and presently the sage stepped before the king and said your majesty we are now ready to give our answer we who have the power to look deep into the bowels of the earth know well that beneath the plain where you have sought to build your tower should you dig never so deep you would find nothing but the good brown soil of your majesty's kingdom at this merlin smiled and shook his dark curls you tell us then said the king let your workmen dig replied the boy and beneath the plain they will find a deep pool and when the workmen had dug they found just as merlin had prophesied a deep dark pool beneath the plain then cried the king 
my wise men have been put to shame by this mere lad his life shall be spared but they for their deceit shall be driven in disgrace from my kingdom but merlin interposed saying not yet sir king i pray you let us have another test that you may feel perfectly sure ask your wise men what lies under the pool that lay under the plain where you sought to build your tower again the wise ones talked together and again because they knew not what else to say they gave the same answer sir king you will find good brown earth beneath the pool that lay beneath the plain where your majesty sought to build his tower no sir king said merlin beneath the pool you will find two great stones let your workmen drain the pool and see and when the pool was drained there lay two immense boulders just as merlin had said truly this is a marvellous child exclaimed vortigern away with my false prophets from this time forth i will have no wise man but merlin stay your majesty said merlin let there be one more test then no question can ever arise in your mind ask your wise men what lies beneath the stones that lay beneath the pool that lay beneath the plain where you sought to build your tower but this time the wise ones were wise enough to hold their peace very well said merlin then i will tell you beneath the stones you will find two great dragons one red the other white during the day these monsters sleep but at night they awaken and fight and it was because of their terrible underground battles that your tower could not be made to stand the night following the raising of the stones they will fight for the last time for the red dragon will kill the white one and after that o oh mighty king you may build your tower in peace then the wise ones trembled and silently they followed the king and merlin across the plain to watch the fatal raising of the stones when at last the mighty boulders had yielded to the combined strength of all the workmen there before the eyes of the crowds that had gathered lay the two dragons fast asleep now send the people away said merlin to the king but you and i must stay here and watch for at midnight the dragons will fight their last battle and when the crowds had dispersed and the wise men slunk away one by one vortigern and the boy merlin sat alone together on the brink of the pool as the evening shadows fell the air grew chill presently the moon arose shedding its weird light upon the strange scene and still the dragons slept on toward midnight merlin leaned forward and lightly touching the king's arm whispered see they are about to awaken make no noise then slowly and still drowsily the great white dragon stirred and opened his hideous eyes while along his whole scaly body there ran a shudder this seemed to arouse the red monster from his dreams for before king vortigern could draw breath the two terrible creatures had risen on their bat-like wings far above his head and with fire streaming from their nostrils were gnashing upon each other with their fangs and striking at each other with their ugly claws for an hour or more the awful battle continued sometimes far above their heads and sometimes perilously near them on the earth and it seemed to the king that neither would ever be able to gain an advantage so well were they matched after a while however the white beast began to show signs of weakening and at last with a mighty crash he fell to the ground dead then the red dragon spread his wings and with a strange hissing sound vanished into the shadows of the night never to be seen again by mortal eyes tell me said the king when he could find sufficient voice to speak tell me o oh wonderful boy that you are what do these strange things mean i will tell you o oh mighty king without fear or favour replied merlin although i know full well what i have to say will not be at all to your liking you may build your tower now for there is nothing to hinder you and you may shut yourself up within its strong walls 
nevertheless pendragon and utha the sons of king constantine whose trust you betrayed and the brothers of the young heir constans whom you so cruelly murdered have to-day landed on your shores with a mighty army forty days and forty nights shall the siege continue and at the end of that time your tower shall be destroyed with every living soul within its walls then shall reign in britain first pendragon and afterwards utha and all the days of their lives they shall war against the saxon whom you sir king have brought to this land the white dragon stands for the saxon and the red dragon for the briton long and deadly shall be the strife between them but in the fullness of time there shall be born to uther a son whose name shall be called arthur he shall be the greatest king that these islands are destined ever to know and his wonderful knights shall make war on the saxon and drive them from the land so shall the mischief of your reign be repaired for a season then the king still clinging to the shadow of his former hope hastened the building of the tower and shut himself within its mighty walls nevertheless within forty days after the beginning of the siege having been driven back time and again pendragon and uther counselled by merlin threw burning brands over the ramparts so that the tower took fire and burned with a mighty conflagration until all within had perished thus was merlin's prophecy concerning vortigern fulfilled and as for the other prophecies that is another story End of Tale One Tale Two of the Story of King Arthur This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russell Newton The Story of King Arthur in Twelve Tales by Winona Caroline Martin Tale Two how Arthur won his kingdom. For many a petty king ere Arthur came ruled in this isle, and ever waging war each upon other wasted all the land. And still from time to time the heathen hosts swarmed over seas and harried what was left. And so there grew great tracts of wilderness, wherein the beast was ever more and more, but man was less and less, till Arthur came. Tennyson's Coming of Arthur now my lords vertigan the usurper is dead and you must turn your attention to hindgist with his saxon hordes for between his people and yours shall be the struggle for the possession of this fair land of britain it was merlin who spoke and he stood in the throne room in the old castle of constantine before pendragon and uther the exiled princes who had at last come into their own again they looked at the child with curiosity mingled with awe and presently pendragon said you're a wonderful boy, Merlin, for by your counsel you have helped us to overthrow Vortigern. Now tell us, if you can, who shall be victorious in the struggle between Britain and Saxon? Come to the window, Merlin replied, and I will show you a strange sight. Then, followed by the young princes, he crossed the hall, drew aside the heavy hangings of scarlet samite that shut out the cool night air, and, having done so, pointed to the starlit sky. See, said he, stepping back, so as not to obstruct the view. The princes looked, and beheld a strange sight indeed, for in the heavens there blazed a comet of enormous size, whose dragon-shaped tail was like a cloud of fire, from the mouth of which shot forth two long rays, one stretching away over the sunny land of France, the other ending in seven smaller rays over the Irish sea. "'Tell us, Merlin, what do these things mean?' they asked. Here then the interpretation, replied Merlin. On Salisbury Plain there shall be a great battle fought, and the outcome is still uncertain. If you ask my aid, however, the British arms shall be victorious. Nevertheless, one of you, which one I may not tell, shall be slain, but the other shall become king of Britain. Then shall he that is king take his brother's name and add it to his own, that the dead man's memory may not perish from the earth. Furthermore, he shall raise over his lost brother's grave a monument that shall stand for ever. 
the comet signifies the one who shall survive and the rays over france and ireland show that he shall have a son mightier than himself who shall hold sway over the lands that the rays cover the name of that son shall be called arthur and he shall drive the heathen from the realm then merlin you will help us in this battle asked both brothers together i will help you replied merlin on one condition what is that they inquired that whichever one of you comes through victorious shall give me his first son on the day of his birth for i must bring him up if he is to be fitted for his great part in life then because the battle seemed to them a thing so terribly near and the birth of a son a thing so far in the future they were willing enough to agree promise said merlin turning first to pendragon i promise said the young man gravely promise repeated the boy to uther and like his brother uther answered i promise then i will give you my aid swore merlin and he kept his word for on the day of that terrible battle the saxon were driven from the field with great slaughter but when the britons returned from the pursuit to seek their wounded they found pendragon dead upon the plain with all his wounds in front he died as he lived like a brave soldier said uther and now merlin tell me how i may keep my promise to raise to his memory a monument that shall stand for ever for ever is a long time nevertheless counselled merlin send to ireland for the giant's dance and what may the giant's dance be inquired uther a great circle of stones replied merlin that the giants brought from africa many years ago send for these stones then you will have a monument that shall stand to the end of time so uther sent great ships to ireland and with merlin's aid secured the magic stones and had them set up on salisbury plain in a great circle which the people called ever after stonehenge and there those same stones stand or lie to this very day after that uther caused two great golden dragons to be made in the likeness of the beast he had seen in the tail of the comet one of these he gave to the cathedral at winchester and the other he carried before him on his standard into all his battles then he added his brother's name to his own so that he was known ever after as uther pendragon the dragon's head so he reigned in britain in place of vortigern the usurper and fought against the saxon whom vortigern had brought to the land all the days of his life now it happened when he had been king some years that there came a time of great rejoicing in the realm for at dusk on the day of the feast of pentecost the old bell in castle tower rang out a merry peal announcing to the people far and wide that a son had been born to king uther pendragon and his beautiful queen igerna so there was joy in the palace and in all the country round but uther alone did not rejoice for he remembered his promise to merlin when the shades of night had fallen therefore he took his tiny baby boy in his arms held him for a moment so that Queen Igerna might press her white lips against his little cheek. Then he himself dressed the child in rich cloth of gold as befitted a king's son, and, having sworn them to secrecy, gave him to two brave knights and two fair ladies of the court with instructions to ask no questions, but deliver him to the care of an old man whom they would find waiting at the postern gate. The knights and ladies were greatly astonished at this seemingly unreasonable command. Nevertheless, they dared not disobey the king so they did as they were told and sorrowfully stood at the gate as the strange old man disappeared with the royal child into the shadows of the night long afterwards however when their lips were unsealed they told strange tales of a light that had shone about the baby's head just before he was swallowed up in the darkness and of fairy faces that had bent tenderly over his helpless form so the longed-for heir was carried away on the very night of his birth from his father's palace by Merlin. For the old man was he in his favorite disguise, and none knew, not even King Uther and Queen Agerna, what had become of him. The people, however, believed that he was dead. Two years passed by, during which time Uther fought many brave battles against the Saxon, but at last there came a day when he was brought home ill of a fatal malady, and there was great lamentation throughout the realm, because he was leaving no heir to succeed him. For three days he had lain speechless, and at last his ministers called for Merlin and begged his help. "'The king is so ill,' said they, "'that he cannot make it known whom he will have to reign in his stead when he is gone. And you know what that means, Merlin. All the mighty barons will struggle for the possession of the crown, and the land will be wasted through their strife. 
Tell us, O man of wisdom, what must we do? Call these same mighty barons together, said Merlin, and before them all I will make him speak. He vanished, but his command was obeyed, and when the great lords of the realm had gathered silently in the chamber of their dying monarch, Merlin suddenly reappeared in their midst. Sir King, said he, as you are about to depart from your people, tell them that all may hear who shall reign in Britain when you are gone. Slowly, the large eyes of Uther Pendragon opened, and he gazed first at Merlin, then at his barons, many of whom were but waiting, as he knew well enough, until the breath had left his body before falling upon each other in a wild and lawless struggle for the crown. Then his tongue was loosed, and speaking clearly and distinctly, that none might fail to understand, he said, My own son Arthur shall reign in Britain after me. He shall be a greater and nobler king than I have been, and he shall drive the Saxon from the land. The king's mind wanders, said the people, but Uther did not hear them, for, having spoken, he turned his face to the wall and died. And when they looked about for Merlin, strange to say, he too had disappeared. Then followed the saddest years that the country of Britain had ever known. There was no longer any law in the land, for each mighty baron was little more than a robber to steal from those of his own rank, and guarding the interests of the poor peasants depended upon him as the wolf guards the flock. Furthermore, each gathered his forces together, and tried by the power of his might, which was the only right then respected, to seize the crown. So the land became desolate, the dreaded Saxon made his raids unmolested, the grain fields were trampled, houses were burned, and strong men were thrown into prison for debt while their wives and children starved. Thus fifteen years passed away, and the people in their misery cried, Woe to the fair land of Britain! Oh, that Uther had left us a son whose strong arm would have kept order in the realm. Yet all the time Merlin kept himself hidden away, so that none had seen him since the hour of the king's death. There came at last a winter when the snow fell early and lay deep upon the ground, and gray famine stalked abroad throughout the countryside. Then Bryce, the good Archbishop of Canterbury, burdened with the misery of his people, withdrew himself for a season of fasting and prayer. One morning, as he was bringing a long night watch to a close, he turned and saw standing before him in the dim light an old man with a flowing white beard. "'Merlin! Merlin! At last!' he cried in joy. "'Where have you kept yourself these fifteen long years while the land of Uther has been desolate?' "'That I may not tell you,' replied Merlin, and the sound of his voice gladdened the heart of the holy man. "'That I may not tell you, and you must not ask.' but now I am here, and I am come to help you in your great need. Then tell me, said the archbishop, where I may find a man with a hand firm enough to rule over these robber barons, yet with a heart of mercy that will cause him to deal justly with rich and poor alike. Such a man there surely is, and Merlin looked wiser than ever, but you must find him for yourself, otherwise he would not be received. Alas, I have sought him in vain these fifteen years, replied the good man sadly, if he can be found, give us your aid, Merlin, and do not deceive me, for my people are perishing. Listen well to my advice, then, warned Merlin. Call together the lords of the realm, and bid them come to London to keep the Christmas feast, and at that time shall a miracle be wrought to show who is the rightful king. Then the messengers rode forth, north and south and east and west, so that the great men were gathered together on Christmas Eve that they might spend the holy night confessing their sins, before hearing mass at break of day. And when all was over, and the pale streaks of dawn were appearing in the wintry sky, a strange sight met their eyes. In the churchyard, against the high altar, stood a great stone, four feet square. Upon the stone was set an anvil of steel one foot high, and into the anvil was thrust a sword of curious workmanship upon whose bejeweled hilt were engraved these words. Whoso pulleth out this sword of this stone and anvil, is rightwise king born of all England. At that sight a thrill of joy shot through the heart of every man present. Each robber baron thought to himself, Now is my chance to show that I am best fitted to wield the scepter of Uther Pendragon. But the lips of the good archbishop moved in a prayer of thankfulness. Praise God the miracle, he murmured reverently. Then, in a clear, ringing voice, he gave the command, Arrange yourselves, my lords, in the order of your rank. Tributary king, duke, Earl, Count, Baron, and Simple Knight, 
Then, beginning at the highest, let each one come forward to try this adventure of the sword. So they came, those mighty men of a hundred battles, Uther's warriors, tested and tried. And each in turn tugged with all his might upon the jeweled hilt of the sword, but never did it stir by a hair's breadth for the mightiest of them. And when the most lowly knight had proved himself as powerless as the most haughty tributary king, the archbishop turned to the amazed company, saying, My lords, I see that this is a question of purity of heart as well as of strength of muscle, and I fear the best knight of the realm is not, after all, among us today. Therefore, there must be another trial. I will, then, appoint twelfth day for this second test. See to it that the news is spread abroad, so that every gentleman of arms of whatever rank shall be present without fail. Now it was the custom of those times, whenever knights were gathered together in large numbers, to hold tournaments, which were in reality sham battles. So it happened that while the lords remained in London awaiting the second trial of the sword, they decided to amuse themselves in true knightly fashion by holding such a tournament on New Year's Day in the fields outside the town. And truly a great sight it was, that gathering of gentlemen of arms with their glittering armor, flashing swords, streaming banners, and prancing horses, well worth the enthusiasm of the great crowd of commoners that had gathered to see them. A great sight indeed, and not one that either noble or commoner would willingly miss. All along the king's highway, therefore, that first crisp winter's morning of the new year rode one of the few true-hearted knights still left in Britain, Sir Ector the Upright, accompanied by his newly knighted son, Sir Kay, and with them, because he had begged to be permitted to see the tourney, rode a younger son, Arthur, a lad of seventeen, who acted as his brother's squire. This fair-haired, blue-eyed boy watched eagerly the gathering of the knights, and felt his heart thrill within him at the thought that some day, if he performed his present humble duties as well as lay in his power, he too might hope to receive the order of knighthood. As the three neared the lists, Sir Kay suddenly made a distressing discovery. He had left his sword at home. Turning quickly to Arthur, therefore, and speaking none too gently, as is the way at times with big brothers, he said, Ride back, boy, and get my sword, and see to it that you hurry, too, so that I need not miss any of the jousts. Now Arthur was longing to see all that there was to be seen. Moreover, like the spirited boy he was, he resented his brother's tone of command. Then he remembered that only a good squire could ever hope to become a worthy knight, so he answered meekly enough, Certainly I will go, Kay, and away he went without a murmur. When he reached his home, however, what was his distress to find the drawbridge raised and every door and window barred and bolted, for the servants, taking advantage of their master's absence, had deserted their posts and gone to mingle with the crowd at the tournament. Alas, I cannot cross the moat, and I could not break in if I did, he cried in dismay. So he turned and rode back to London, sad because he must fail in even so humble a quest. Now it happened that this way lay past the churchyard, and it also happened that because of his youth and insignificance no one had thought it worth while to tell him about the mystic sword in the anvil. When he rode past, therefore, he saw an unused weapon, it occurred to him that it would do no harm to borrow it for the day, that his brother need not be without a sword. So he slipped from his horse, stepped inside the enclosure, and looked about for someone whose permission he might ask. But the church was deserted as his own castle had been. At last, seeing no other way out of the difficulty, he lightly took the sword by the hilt and, never stopping to read the words engraved upon it, drew it forth from the anvil as easily as he might have drawn the play-sword of his childhood, long since discarded, from its tiny scabbard. Then gladly he spurred his horse that he might the sooner deliver the weapon into his brother's hand. But when Sir Kay saw that bejeweled hilt, a dull red flush suffused his cheek, and a strange sparkle leapt into his eyes. "'Where did you get this, Arthur?' he whispered eagerly, drawing the boy aside that none might overhear the conversation. "'In the churchyard,' replied Arthur innocently. "'I will take it back as soon as you have finished with it, Kay, so there is no harm done, is there?' "'There is no harm done yet, if you were not seen and can keep silent,' said Kay mysteriously. "'Hush! Don't speak of it to anyone.' Then he rode away, leaving his young brother awed and full of fear, lest he had done some wicked deed. Kay, however, lost no time in seeking his father, before whom he triumphantly displayed the weapon, crying, "'See, father, I, your son, have drawn the sword from the anvil. Therefore I am the rightful king of Britain.' But the good Sir Ector, after looking first at the sword and then at Kay, 
laid his hand on the young man's shoulder and said gravely k k tell me the truth by the honor of your knighthood how came you by that sword then k whose eyes could not meet his father's hung his head in shame and answered my brother arthur brought it to me send the boy here commanded sir rector and when arthur stood before him he asked more gravely than ever arthur how did you come by this sword and the lad though now quite convinced that he had unwittingly done some great wrong looked up into his father's face and answered bravely i drew it from the anvil that stands on the stone in the churchyard if it was not right father i am sorry arthur said sir rector and now his voice was stern tell me the truth as you hope one day to become a brave and honorable knight where did you find this sword again arthur looked up into his father's face repeating his former words then sir ector could doubt no longer come with me to the good archbishop said he that we may tell him the whole story when the archbishop had heard all he said gravely put the sword back in the anvil my boy and let it remain there until twelfth day if you can pull it out then before all the lords of the realm after they have tried for the second time and failed then young as you are we shall know that our prayers have been answered and that god himself has given us a king so on twelfth day the nobles were again assembled and when mass had been said the trial began for a second time but just as before tributary king duke earl count baron and simple knight each came forward in his turn and tugged and pulled with all his might in vain then when the last knight had turned away defeated the voice of the archbishop was heard above the tumult stay yet a while my lords said he there is still another to make the trial they halted and to the scornful amazement of all out from an obscure corner stepped a lad in the simple dress of a squire modestly with flushed cheeks and lowered eyelids he passed through their midst straight up to the great stone and with no effort using but one hand drew the glittering sword from its firm seat in the anvil for a moment a deep hush fell upon the company then there began to be heard an angry murmur like the rumble of a fast approaching storm who is this boy one knight was asking another the son of sir ector in whose veins there runs no noble blood came the answer from one or two away with him then away with him they all cried together miracle or no miracle we will not have this beardless boy to reign over us the good archbishop with the exception of sir ector was the only one that had been truly glad but now as he looked down upon that sea of angry faces the words that were about to proclaim arthur king died on his lips for he feared lest these men should fall upon the child and take his life suddenly invisible to all others merlin stood once again at the holy man's side tell them said he to return to their homes and together again on candlemas day for a third trial so the angry multitude was safely dispersed but on candlemas day the same scene was re-enacted and so again at easter but still the lords would not submit then merlin said to the holy man tell them that there will be one last and final test at the feast of pentecost then at that time they must bring together all their mighty men all the flower of their knighthood and that he that draws the sword on that day is without further question king of britain so at that feast of pentecost more than fifteen years after the death of uther pendragon the mighty men of the realm were once again gathered together in old london town then for the fifth time with might and main they made the trial of the sword without success but when for the fourth time before them all the boy arthur had lightly drawn it from the anvil merlin appeared to the whole company standing at the lad's side my lords of britain said he you have sought to reject this boy because you thought him not of royal blood sir ector tell us is he your son then to the amazement of all sir ector the upright whose words none could doubt answered simply he is not though i have loved and cherished him as my own since the day you brought him to me merlin a baby but a few hours old now hear the truth continued merlin your king uther pendragon was not wandering in his mind when he spoke those words on his deathbed eighteen years ago to-day there was a born to king uther and his queen the beautiful igerna a son that child that he might be kept safe during the helpless years of his infancy and that he might be made fit to rule in justice and in mercy over this troubled land was delivered to me at the postern gate 
I took him to Sir Ector, the most upright knight among you, with strict instructions that he be kept in ignorance of his birth. Then Merlin, taking the boy's hand, led him forth where he might be seen not only by the nobles, but also by the crowd of commoners that had gathered to see the outcome, and with a loud voice he cried, People of Britain, behold your king, Arthur, son of Uther Pendragon, the child of prophecy, he that shall restore peace and drive the heathen from the realm. Then, like a deep roar from a thousand throats, came the glad response, Long live Arthur! Long live the king! End of Tale 2《Tale Three of the Story of King Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mendel Hastings. The Story of King Arthur in Twelve Tales by Winona Carolyn Martin. Tale Three How Arthur Won His Sword Excalibur, His Bride, and His Round Table. But Arthur, looking downward as he passed, felt the light of her eyes into his life, smite on the sudden. Tennyson's Coming of Arthur The commoners had indeed shouted joyfully, Long live the king! And many of the nobles also had been glad to see the end of the long struggle for the crown. But there were others, strong and mighty warriors, who were not yet willing to submit to the rule of a beardless boy. The first year of Arthur's reign, therefore, was a turbulent one, for, between the rebellion of his own subjects on the one hand and the raids of the Saxons on the other, he scarcely knew what it was to lay aside his armor for so much as a single day. Gradually, however, the young king's bravery and nobility of character began to call forth the respect of those who were watching his career, so that one by one the knights of his realm, conquered either by force of arms or better still by admiration came to pay him homage and very soon even those robber barons found themselves being transformed under the chivalric influences that prevailed at that court soon after his coronation arthur appointed his officers at the request of the good sir ector whom the young king would always regard as a father he appointed his foster brother sir kay seneschal of all britain then he remembered old friends of his real father uther pendragon and made sir baldwin constable sir ulfius chamberlain and sir brastius warden of the country north of the river trent this done he fought twelve great battles to bring into subjection the tributary kings who still held out against him then he felt that his realm was in about as good order as he could well expect it to be in those wild and lawless times in all these battles the sword that he had drawn from the anvil served him well but strange to say one day when he was jousting with a single knight the latter's stronger weapon cut arthur's sword in two leaving the young king defenceless so that he was severely wounded and would probably have been killed had it not been for merlin who bore him away to a hermitage where he lay ill for three days during that time however it was not so much by his suffering that he was troubled as by the discovery of the loss of his sword but when he made his anxiety known to merlin the wise man merely smiled one of those mysterious smiles of his and said that sir king is perhaps the best thing that ever happened to you as soon as you are strong enough to wield it you shall have a far better weapon i promise you by the third day therefore no entreaties could prevail upon him to remain under the care of the kindly hermit any longer i must be up and away to find that sword said he so merlin answered very well follow me then off they rode up hill and down dale through a strange and wonderful country until at last they came to the shores of a broad and beautiful lake over which a fairy veil of light morning mist was still hanging they drew rein in silence and watched the sun gradually rise from behind the distant hilltops presently under the gentle warmth the mist began to lift 
so that very soon the waters lay before them clear as crystal and shimmering in the glorious morning light then a strange thing happened up from the bosom of the lake rose an arm clothed in white samite in whose hand was clasped a sword and scabbard and the hilt of that sword was ten times more beautiful and twinkling with far richer jewels than the weapon whose loss arthur was mourning how i wish it were mine he whispered to merlin tremulously hush was the only reply look toward the other side of the lake arthur obeyed and saw gliding toward them what at first appeared to be a column of white mist not yet dispelled by the sun's rays but which gradually resolved itself into the form of a beautiful maiden whose feet skimmed the waves as lightly as if they had been the floating petals of a pond lily that merlin whispered is the lady of the lake when she comes near ask her for the sword for it is hers and belongs to her wonderful palace under the water arthur then leapt from his horse and stepping to the very brink of the waves bowed low saying fair damsel you see before you a knight who has been so unfortunate as to lose his sword if you will give me yours i will promise you to do all in my power to make this land so safe that no maiden will ever after need to own a weapon for there will be enough brave and chivalrous knights to fight the battles of all the weak and oppressed you may have the sword king arthur replied the lady to do with as you have promised take the barge that you will find hidden in yonder rushes and row out to claim it it is yours to use for many years to come having said this the form of the maiden grew more and more mist-like and ethereal until finally Arthur's wandering eyes could no longer distinguish the faintest trace of her. Then he and Merlin rode out to the middle of the lake, and Arthur, almost fearing to see it vanish too, firmly grasped the sword, whereupon the arm clothed in white samite was immediately withdrawn, and the waters closed over it. The moment that the weapon touched the young king's hand, a strange thrill seemed to pass through his whole being, and he felt within himself the strength of ten men. Curiously, he drew it from its scabbard and saw the blade flash in the sunlight so that he was almost blinded. Merlin, meanwhile, had been watching him with interest, and now he put a strange question to him. "'Which would you rather have?' said he. "'The sword or the scabbard?' Then Arthur, brave knight that he was, answered almost scornfully, What a question, Merlin! The sword, to be sure! It is the most wonderful thing I have ever seen. When I hold it in my hand, I feel that no enemy could ever again prevail against me. It is a wonderful weapon indeed, replied Merlin gravely. The name of it is Excalibur, which is to say, Cut Steel and it is given to you whom men will call the white king that you may fight and not to win glory for yourself but to right the wrongs of the weak and the oppressed as you have promised and that you may drive the heathen from the land yes it is a wonderful sword but the scabbard is more wonderful still for while it is in your possession you can never be killed in battle and though you may be wounded your wounds will never bleed and you will lose no strength guard it well they were silent for a while as merlin rode back to shore and arthur stood lost in thought examining his treasure see said he at last on each side of the blade there is an inscription in a foreign tongue can you read them for me merlin the words are ancient hebrew was the reply one side says take me and the other side says cast me away then which ought i to do asked arthur puzzled take it and strike was the firm answer the time to cast it away will come but it is still far distant yes take the sword and strike with all your might now it happened that not long after his adventure arthur had an opportunity of testing the powers of this wonderful excalibur 
as he sat in his throne room one day in the castle at camelot two messengers arrived and were ushered into his presence we come said they from king leodogran of cameliard who pays tribute to you as he paid it to your royal father uther pendragon our king is aged and his knights too are well advanced in years so that they can no longer fight as in the days of old and now our kingdom is threatened by one ryance king of north wales for he has sent a message to our master saying that he has in preparation a mantle whose only trimming shall be the beards of kings eleven of these beards he has already but he needs one more and he incidentally demands that our good master send him his otherwise he says he will come and take it along with the head to which it belongs therefore have we come to you o young white king of the noble heart and mighty arm because you have made it known that you ever stand ready to render aid to the weak and the oppressed at these words arthur's heart leapt within him so glad was he of this opportunity of using excalibur in another's cause then he looked about among his knights and saw the fire of his own enthusiasm leap into the eyes of first one and then another the next moment the whole room presented the appearance of a forest of glittering swords for every weapon had been drawn from its scabbard and was being pointed upward as a sign that its owner was ready to follow his liege lord into battle while a cry arose from all as from one man the quest sir king in an incredibly short time the army was on the march northward through the deep snows for it was winter nevertheless it so happened that by merlin's aid it reached cameliard even before the return of the messengers from leodogran had sent strangely unwearied by the journey it arrived at the gate of the city one evening when the sun was sinking in the west and found as was but natural in time of war that all was tightly closed ride straight on said merlin as if there were no obstacle in your way and you will find no difficulty and so it was for when arthur's horse came abreast the gates swung wide and the whole army passed through and started on its way to the castle where leodogran was holding a council of war the young king's intentions were so good that he had scarcely realized what the effect of such an entrance into the town would be upon the people now however he saw them come trooping from their homes to stand in the streets silent with amazement and pale with fear while every roof was crowded with terrified women and children even to the battlements of the palace itself where some of the ladies of the court having heard a rumour of strange happenings had climbed and were looking down upon the invading host it was at this moment that arthur chanced to raise his eyes and what he saw was a vision that never faded for him through all the days of his life this was the face of a girl the glory of whose golden hair was lighted by the setting sun so that it appeared to the young man like the halo of a saint who is that merlin he asked breathlessly that replied the wise one whose gaze did not even have to follow arthur's to learn of whom he spoke that is the princess guinevere the only daughter of leodogran and cherished by him as the apple of his eye the young man said no more but at that moment he made a mighty resolve to fight in the cause of the old king as he had never fought before and he suddenly felt his arm strengthened as it had not been even by that first touch of excalibur he merlin and a few of the chief nobles now passed into the council chamber where the news of their sudden and mysterious arrival had created even more terror than their march through the streets it was arthur's plan to keep his identity a secret until after the battle and this was an easy matter for leodogran could not imagine it possible that aid could have reached him from camelot so soon but it proved a harder matter to make the old king feel that he could trust these strangers no one could ever look long into arthur's face however without coming to believe in his truth and sincerity so before the council closed it was arranged that leodogran while waiting the return of his messengers should accept the help of these strange visitors 
the next morning therefore the two armies were on the march toward the plain just outside the city walls where ryans himself a man twice the size of ordinary men was encamped with his giant knights merlin bore before his sovereign the mystic standard with the golden dragon that had belonged to uther pendragon but which now that it was arthur's ensign was beginning to show more wonderful qualities than ever for as the battle waxed hotter and hotter it seemed that the dragon was spouting fire from his nostrils so that the young king's position was easily distinguished by the anxious spectators on the city walls and especially by the ladies on the battlements of the castle among whom was the princess guinevere all day long the battle raged but wherever arthur appeared with the strange standard the enemies giants though they were either fled terror-stricken or fell lifeless under the mighty strokes of excalibur until gradually they were driven farther and farther from the walls and it seemed that the victory was well nigh in sight then a terrible thing happened leodogran exhausted by the struggle but feeling secure in his young champion's strength had withdrawn himself to a quieter part of the field this however was the very opportunity for which ryance had been waiting leaving arthur therefore still in the thick of the fight he and a dozen or more of his knights wheeled their horses about and bore down upon the old king with the intention of dragging him off a prisoner to the princess from her point of vantage on the tower it seemed that her father was now lost indeed and she had almost fainted in despair when she saw the young stranger stop fighting disentangle himself from the fray and speed across the plain there he charged with such a mighty shock against the giants that were bearing leodogran away that they dropped their prisoner and fled for their lives a moment later the whole army of ryans was in confused retreat with arthur and his knights in pursuit thus the day was won for king leodogran and that evening at the feast that was made for the victors the beautiful princess to show her gratitude served the valiant young stranger with her own fair hands and thanked him simply and modestly for saving her father's life that night if ever in his life arthur had expected to sleep soundly but he found to his surprise that even the weariness of his body was not sufficient to overcome this strange new agitation of his heart at dawn therefore he arose and sought the counsel of merlin merlin said he trying to pretend that it was a matter of state that had been disturbing his rest my lords have long advised me to take a wife what have you to say on this subject is there any damsel in particular that you have in mind asked the wise man endeavouring to look very sober yes said arthur the princess guinevere is the fairest maiden in all the world as any man with eyes can see if i might win her for my bride i should be the happiest man on earth and if i were to counsel you not to try to win her would that make any difference asked merlin quietly not the slightest was the firm reply then why are you asking my advice and the wise one smiled i do not ask it merlin admitted arthur this is a matter that i settle for myself but i do beseech you to go to king leodogran for me and ask for his daughter's hand i may have to make your identity known said merlin that you have my permission to do if necessary arthur agreed a little later in the day therefore when king leodogran and his ministers were assembled in the throne room merlin came before them and made a formal request for the hand of the princess in the name of his young master when he had finished speaking a deep silence fell upon the room presently the old king began to speak your master said he is a brave knight and a valiant gentleman and to the care of such a one i would gladly give the jewel of my court moreover my debt of gratitude to him is greater than i can ever repay and yet and yet and yet what inquired merlin my child is the daughter of a long line of kings therefore it is not fitting that i should bestow her hand upon one whose rank is not equal to her own and yet and yet then the wise man smiled have you any idea my lord said he 
who the young knight is who fought so valiantly in your cause no replied leodogran he seemed unwilling to tell me so by the laws of courtesy i was bound to ask no questions then sir king let me inform you and merlin's voice rang out clear and strong that he is arthur himself your liege lord who by my aid was able to reach you even before the return of your own messengers and you are merlin cried the old king in joy you are welcome in my court o wise man as welcome as the news that you bring me for what greater happiness could come to me in my old age than that Arthur, the son of my friend and overlord Uther Pendragon, should seek my daughter in marriage? You and he are welcome indeed. The following day, therefore, when Arthur and his army set out on their homeward journey, he and the princess were already betrothed, and it was all arranged that, when the winter snows had melted, making it fit for her to travel, he would send for her that they might be married in his own capital city of Camelot. So Arthur returned to his own land and fought many a brave battle with his strong arm and Excalibur, while he waited impatiently for the first signs of spring. At last, however, the sun began to take on a new warmth, the snow gradually disappeared from hillside and plain, and a tender emerald haze silently enveloped the landscape. Then Arthur called to his side a young knight, lately come to his court, Launcelot of the Lake by name, between whom and the king there existed the tenderest bond of friendship based upon mutual admiration. Launcelot, said he, I am a king, the servant of my people, therefore I cannot, as other men, leave my post of duty to seek my bride. Go then for me, my most trusted friend, take Merlin with you, lest you should need his aid and bring me the beautiful princess guinevere so the embassy set through the soft april green and returned when the woods were white with may southward toward the city of camelot at launcelot's side rode guinevere the flower of the may seated on a cream-white mule and wearing a gown of grass-green silk fastened with a golden clasp when they neared the mystic city upon whose gates arthur's wars were prophetically rendered the young king himself rode out to meet his bride and the next day they were married in the church at camelot the holy archbishop himself pronouncing the words that bound them together for life as they turned from the altar and passed homeward through the streets of the city which the little children had strewn with flowers they were met by a band of white-garbed knights who blew upon golden trumpets and joyfully sang blow trumpet for the world is white with may blow trumpet the long night hath rolled away blow through the living world let the king reign shall rome or heathen rule in arthur's realm flash brand and lance fall battle-axe on helm fall battle-axe and flash brand let the king reign strike for the king and live his knights have heard that god hath told the king a secret word fall battle-axe and flash brand let the king reign blow trumpet he will lift us from the dust blow trumpet live the strength and die the lust clang battle-axe and clash brand let the king reign strike for the king and die and if thou diest the king is king and ever wills the highest clang battle-axe and clash brand let the king reign blow for our son is mighty in his may blow for our son is mightier day by day clang battle-axe and clash brand let the king reign the king will follow christ and we the king in whom high god hath breathed a secret thing fall battle axe and flash brand let the king reign such were the glories of arthur's wedding day yet these were not all there remained yet a greater wonder as the young king with his bride entered the chamber where the banquet was spread a strange sight met his eyes in the centre of the room stood an immense round table of rare workmanship what is that merlin he inquired surprised and why is it here that replied the wise man is a mystic table that i myself made many years ago for your father uther pendragon it comes to you now as a wedding gift from king leodogran in whose keeping it has been since uther's death 
about it as you see are places for a hundred and fifty knights your father-in-law as part of his gift has sent you one hundred the other fifty seats or sieges you are to fill yourself with young men of your own age as they prove themselves worthy but remember that none must ever take his place until his name appears of its own accord upon the siege that he is to occupy an odd hush fell upon the company while each man present was secretly wondering if he would be among the chosen ones then the archbishop stepped forward and raised his arms over the table in blessing as his words died away a strange thing happened upon one siege after another as if a mysterious flame were leaping from place to place golden letters spelling the names of knights began to appear until there were but twenty-two unclaimed places in reverent silence the men thus called took their seats and while they yet waited one more siege began to glow with a mysterious writing this time however instead of a name there appeared these words this is the siege perilous in which no man may sit until the coming of the best knight in all the world then arthur reading this inscription turned to merlin in surprise surely said he this is the place of launcelot for where could we ever find a knight that is better than he but the wise man shook his head sadly saying let him never dare to take that place lest he be consumed by fire from heaven the knight who is to sit there will surely come some day but that time is still far distant with these knights you must now found the order of the round table whose members are to be mystically chosen from among the flower of men and whose vows shall be the noblest that ever knights took upon them then each of the chosen ones came forward and kneeling before the throne where arthur sat with his beautiful young queen beside him laid his hand in his sovereigns and took the vow of the order to reverence the king as if he were their conscience and their conscience as their king to break the heathen and uphold the christ to ride abroad redressing human wrongs to speak no slander no nor listen to it to honor his word as if his gods to lead sweet lives in purest chastity to love one maiden only cleave to her and worship her by years of noble deeds until they won her so the sun went down in golden glory upon arthur's wedding day End of Tale 3、Tale、4 of the Story of King Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russell Newton. The Story of King Arthur in Twelve Tales by Winona Caroline Martin. Tale 4. Gareth the Kitchen Knave. And Gareth said, Full pardon, but I follow up the quest, despite of day and night, and death and hell. Tennyson's Gareth and Lynette. Mother, when will you let me go to King Arthur's court? Queen Bellicent, the wife of King Lot of Orkney, raised her troubled eyes to meet the pleading gaze of her youngest son, Gareth. Oh, Gareth, Gareth. She replied in a voice from which tears were not far distant. You are still a child, and have you no pity for my loneliness? Both your brothers are in Arthur's halls, unless one or both of them is at this very moment lying dead, pierced by a dozen wounds. You do not know what it means to be a knight and daily risk your life in brain stunning shocks and tourney falls. Ah, mother, mother, cried the young man with kindling eyes, it is for that very reason that I long to go. No, no, my son, said Bellicent, and shook her head sadly. Stay a while longer. Follow the deer in your own father's forests, and so make your manhood mightier day by day. Follow the deer? Mother, I must follow the Christ and the King, or else why was I born? Mother, what can I do to prove to you that I am no longer a child, but a man, ready to take a man's part in life? Do? Well, what would you do to prove it? You who have never felt a finger ache or a pain. Do? Ah, mother, 
I would walk through fire. You would walk through fire, you say? And Bellicent smiled a strange smile. In that case, you surely would not mind a little smoke. A little smoke? Ah, surely not, mother, exclaimed the boy in surprise. Then I will let you go. Truly, mother? On one condition. Yes, anything, anything, only— Then listen carefully, said Queen Bellicent slowly. You may go, if you will go disguised, and hire yourself out to serve meats and drinks for a year and a day among Arthur's scullions and kitchen knaves. Having said this, the queen smiled to herself, for she believed that her princely son was far too proud to submit himself to so humiliating a test. The boy was silent for a while. Then he replied gravely, "'Even though my body were in bondage, mother, I should still be free in soul, and I should see the jousts, and hear the talk of the brave knights, and see the face of the king now and then. Yes, mother, I will do as you say.' Then Bellicent realized that her son was in earnest indeed, and she made no more attempt to prevent his going. One morning, a few days later, therefore, while the anxious mother was still asleep, Gareth quietly arose, and taking with him two faithful serving-men who had waited on him since his birth, set out for Camelot. The three, dressed like tillers of the soil, journeyed southward for two days until, one fair morning, they saw the spires and turrets of the mystic city pricking through the mist. Presently they came to the wonderful gate upon whose keystone stood an image of the Lady of the Lake who had given Excalibur to Arthur. Her garments seemed to be sweeping from her sides like water flowing away, and in the space to left and right of her the young king's wars were shown in weird devices. Gareth and his companions stood staring at this curious gate so long that at last it seemed to them that the pictured dragons upon it began to move and seethe and twine and curl, as if the whole portal were alive, while from within came a sound of weird music, so that the two serving-men would gladly have turned back fearing enchantment. But Gareth pressed right on until he stood in the long vaulted hall of the royal palace itself, where the king sat upon his throne delivering judgment. While Gareth waited, he saw one person after another having a complaint to make or a boon to ask brought before Arthur, who, after listening carefully to the story, would assign the writing of the wrong, if such he deemed it to be, to one of the tall knights that ranged themselves about his throne, so that every now and then one of these would ride away upon his appointed quest. At last it came Gareth's turn to make his plea. Stepping forward, therefore, leaning upon the shoulders of his two servitors as if needing support, he approached and said, A boon, Sir King. Then, as Arthur bent forward graciously to listen, Grant that I may serve among your kitchen knaves for a year and a day. Then, having grown strong with meats and drinks from your table, I shall be able to fight. The king looked at the boy in surprise, for neither his face nor his stalwart young body showed any sign of weakness or starvation. Presently, he said, you appear to be a goodly youth and worth a goodlier boon. Still, as this is what you ask, let it be so. I therefore hand you over to the care of my seneschal, Sir Kay. Gareth turned and looked into the eyes of the man who was henceforth to be his master, and certainly the sight was not at all reassuring, for Kay was the surliest and most unpleasant looking of all the knights at Arthur's court. Humph, he now said crossly, a good-for-nothing fellow, no doubt, who has run away from some abbey where he's been too lazy to earn his food. But he shall work now. I'll see to that, never fear. It chanced, however, that Launcelot, the most illustrious of all the knights and Arthur's dearest friend, was standing by and overheard Kay's remark. Kay, Kay, he said, after having taken a good look at the lad, you may know a great deal about dogs and horses, but not much, I fear, about men. I advise you to treat that boy kindly, for if he is not noble-natured, I am much mistaken, and you may some day discover that he is also of noble blood. Tut, replied Kay scornfully. If he were noble, would he not have asked the king for horse and armor instead of food and drink? Yes, I see that his brow is smooth and his hand is white, but I will soon alter that when I get him among the pots and pans. Then turning to Gareth, Come along, Sir Fair Hands, come along with me. So Gareth passed with Sir Kay from the bright glory of Arthur's Hall down into the smut and grime of the kitchens, where he submitted day after day to being hustled and harried by a master who had no love for him. Thus the first long month of his servitude wore away. Then one day, when the lad was scrubbing away as usual at his pots and pans, seeing how brilliantly he could make them shine, and pretending to himself that he was burnishing his armor, Sir Kay strode into the room and said gruffly, 
ho ho sir fair hands we shall see what is about to happen to you now the king himself has sent for you doubtless to reprimand you for some villainy which you have succeeded in concealing even from me go along at once now though gareth's conscience was clear he could not but help being seriously disturbed by this unexpected summons when therefore having hastily washed off the grime and made himself as presentable as possible he found himself once again in the presence of the great king he was much surprised to read in arthur's smiling countenance no sign of anger or disapproval gareth said he when the two were alone i know your secret your mother has repented of the hard promise she made you give she has therefore sent me a message explaining all and releasing you a man is sometimes knighted gareth on the field of battle for some deed of special bravery i am about to knight you now my boy for the same reason but my lord cried gareth in astonishment i have as yet done no brave deed that is a question of which i will be the judge replied arthur gravely a man on the battlefield or in the tourney has the encouragement of the plaudits of his fellows and is spurred on by excitement and the hope of winning glory but you have toiled nobly in humiliation and obscurity therefore kneel gareth and receive the order of knighthood at those words of praise from the lips of whom the lad honored as he honored no other human being gareth's eyes filled with tears and he knelt humbly to take those vows as is a shame a man should not be bound by yet the which no man can keep then the king gave him three strokes with the flat of his sword and gareth arose a kitchen knave no longer now said arthur still smiling is there another boon that i can grant you sir gareth the lad pondered for a while then he said i am now a knight sir king but i am not yet proven grant therefore that i may wear my disguise a while longer and give me the next quest so shall i spring like flame from ashes i will grant that boon replied the king gravely on condition that my friend sir launcelot may share the secret to this gareth agreed readily enough so he returned to the kitchen to await impatiently the king's next audience day and he had not long to wait for arthur held himself ready whenever possible to hear the complaints of his subjects it happened therefore one fine morning in early summer that a maiden of haughty bearing and high lineage passed into arthur's hall and scarcely waiting to do obeisance burst out with her grievance sir king you have truly driven the heathen from the land as you promise but bandits and robbers still infest many a bridge and ford if i were king i should not rest until the loneliest spot in the realm were as free from bloodshed as your altar cloth fair maiden replied the king courteously ignoring her lack of courtesy rest assured that i and my knights will never lay aside our arms while there is one lonely moorland that is not as safe as the centre of my hall pray tell us your name and your particular need my name said the damsel proudly is lynette my need is a knight to do battle for my sister the lady lioners who lives in castle perilous about which a broad river winds in three loops spanning these loops are three bridges guarded by three bandit knights while a fourth the most terrible of all keeps her a prisoner in her own castle and besieges her there endeavoring to break her will and force her to wed him therefore have i come to you sir king for your very best knight who is sir launcelot as everyone knows send us no other i pray you for already fifty of your knights have given their lives in this cause as their shields testify for they hang as trophies about the black tent of that fourth knight whose face no man has ever seen and whose voice no man has ever heard when she had finished speaking there was silence in the hall save for the clinking sound of weapons about to be withdrawn from their scabbards then in another moment every sword in the room was being pointed forward and upward while the cry rang through the whole castle the quest sir king for the instant arthur so absorbed had he been in the maiden's story had forgotten gareth and the promise he had made him he was smiling now as he paused before assigning the adventure to launcelot to look down upon that forest of swords which spoke to him so eloquently of the valor of his knights suddenly his eye fell upon something that was truly an amazing sight this was a great iron spit raised as high as any sword by the begrimed hand of one of the kitchen knaves then the king remembered his face first flushed and then paled for he knew that gareth though of royal blood was nevertheless but a boy as yet unproved and he knew too that this was a quest 
in which many a full-grown man had failed. Yet he had given his word, and the word of a king may not be broken. Therefore, turning to the poorly clad scullion, he bent his head, saying, Sir Fairhands, the quest is yours. Up to that moment, in the general excitement, none of the knights had noticed the entrance of this intruder in their midst. Now, however, every eye in the room was turned upon the spot where poor Gareth stood with his spit still in his hand. It was a rule at Arthur's court that there should be no murmuring when a quest was assigned. But never before had the self-control of the knights been put to such a test as this. For a while there was a dead silence, which was broken presently by Sir Kay, who could not repress a deep grunt. Then the maiden, having at last realized what had happened, burst forth. "'Shame on you, Sir King, and shame forever on your boasted order of the round table. I, a maiden of gentle birth, have asked you for your best knight, and you have given me your kitchen knave. Your kitchen knave!' Then before any one could stop her, she turned her back on the king, fled from the room, and was on her horse and away. Gareth, however, had no idea of losing his opportunity. Loosening a string, therefore, he allowed his kitchen garb to fall off, revealing the fact, to the amazement of all present, that he was clothed underneath in a full suit of glittering jeweled armor. Then, throwing aside his spit, he seized spear and shield, gifts from the king, and leaping upon a war-horse, another gift, was after the fleeing maiden, before the spectators had had time to recover from their surprise. Just beyond the gates of the city he overtook her, and saw to his dismay that despite his transformation the flush of anger deepened in her cheeks at the sight of him. Nevertheless, he addressed her most courteously. "'Fair damsel,' said he, "'the quest is mine. Ride, and I follow.' At this the maiden drew herself to her full height and answered, while her black eyes flashed scorn upon her would-be champion, "'Sir Scullion, I have but one request to make of you, and that is that you leave me this instant. Far rather would I fall a prey to bandits or wild beasts than be protected by such as you. Leave me, I pray you, for you smell of the kitchen.' "'Damsel,' replied Gareth, still as courteously as ever, "'say what you please to me, but whatever you say, rest assured I will never leave you till I achieve the quest or die in the attempt. Ride, and I follow.' Upon hearing this, without another word, the maiden spurred her palfrey in a vain attempt to outdistance her protector, and so they rode through deep woods until the shades of night overtook them, and they were obliged to seek shelter at a neighboring castle. The next morning, however, the two were early on their way once more, and Gareth had begun to think that the fair Lynette would never deign to speak to him again, when suddenly she reined her horse, thus allowing him to come up with her, and said, "'Sir Scullion,' We shall soon reach the first loop of the river which is guarded, as I told the king, by a bandit knight. He calls himself Morning Star, and I advise you to turn back, for no kitchen knave could ever hope to do battle successfully with such as he. Madam, said Gareth firmly, as I have told you before, this quest is mine. I pray you, ride on, and I follow. She said no more, but scornfully obeyed his command and it was not long before they came to a bridge which spanned a narrow but deep stream. On the farther side Gareth beheld a silk pavilion, gay with golden streaks and rays of the lent lily, except where the dome rose high and purple. From the top there floated a crimson banner, and beneath an unarmed warrior was pacing to and fro. At sight of the maiden's champion, the knight gave a strange call, whereupon three beautiful silken-clad maidens, the daughters of the dawn, whose golden tresses were begemmed with drops of morning dew, came forward and clad the warrior in light blue armor, and placed in his hand a blue shield in the center of which shone a morning star. Then the knight leaped upon his horse, and with fiery speed he and Gareth shocked together in the center of the bridge, so that both their spears were bent. Then each hurled a stone from his catapult, after which, Gareth recovering himself, lashed so fiercely with his brand that he drove his enemy backward down the bridge until his own shield was broken. But the morning star lay groveling at his feet. "'Spare my life, Sir Knight, I yield!' the great warrior was now crying. "'I will spare it,' replied Gareth, "'on condition that this maiden asks me to do so.' "'Insolent scullion!' cried the damsel, flushing. "'Must I stoop so low as to ask a favor of you? I will not.' "'Then he shall die,' said Gareth quietly. "'Stop, rascal!' cried Lynette, as Gareth began to unlace the warrior's helmet. 
it would be a shame for me to allow a knight to be slain by a kitchen knave. Therefore I ask you, Sir Scullion, to spare his life. Rise then, said Gareth to his fallen enemy, but give me your shield in place of my broken one, and ride to Arthur's hall, and there tell the king that his kitchen knave has achieved one-fourth part of his quest. Then to the maiden he said, Ride, damsel, and I follow. On they went, those two strange companions, reviler and reviled, while the sun gradually rose higher in the heavens, and the heat grew more and more oppressive. Toward noon, Lynette slowed her palfrey once again, and turning to her champion, said, Sir Knave, by some evil chance you have managed to overcome a knight. Think not, however, that you will be able to stand against him whom you are now about to encounter. He calls himself Noonday Sun, and his strength as far exceeds that of his brother Morning Star, as the light of the sun at noon exceeds that of the star that fades in the blue of dawn. I warn you for the second time to flee. But Gareth's only answer was, Maiden, the quest is mine. Ride, and I follow. Within a few more moments they had reached the second bend of the river, where they beheld sitting astride a huge red horse, the terrible noonday sun. This man's armor and shield were so brightly burnished that they seemed to cast off sparks so that Gareth was nearly blinded by their splendor. At sight of the boy, this mighty warrior gave an angry cry and plunged into the foaming stream where Gareth met him halfway. Four mighty strokes they gave each other with their swords. Then, because there was no room in the whirling waters for any tourney skill, Gareth feared that he would be overcome and put to shame before the maiden. Just then, however, the knight raised his ponderous arm for a fifth stroke, whereupon his horse slipped in the stream, and the waters extinguished the light of the noonday sun. Gareth, however, was too true a knight to take such an advantage of his enemy. He put his lance across the ford, therefore, and with great difficulty managed to bring him to shore. But the warrior was no longer willing to continue the contest. So Gareth spared his life at the request of the maiden, upon the condition that he ride to Arthur's court and inform the king that one half of the kitchen knave's quest was now achieved. Then the two rode on once more through long hours of the sultry afternoon. Toward evening the maiden reined her horse again and began to speak in a voice that seemed to Gareth just a trifle less scornful. "'Sir Scullion,' said she, "'for kitchen knave you have truly done well. Nevertheless, if the noonday sun horse had not slipped, you certainly would not have been the victor. Therefore I advise you to leave this quest, for the man that you are now to meet as an opponent is an old and seasoned warrior who calls himself Evening Star. You'll have little chance to stand against him, I assure you. Be wise, and flee for your life while there is yet time. Maiden, said Gareth as courteously as ever, the quest is mine. Ride, and I follow. So they rode, and presently reached the third loop of the river, which was spanned by a bridge of treble bow. Beyond this bridge, outlined against the rose-red of the western sky, stood a huge figure, wrapped in hardened skins that fit him like his own. See, whispered the maiden in a frightened voice, if you should succeed in cleaving his armor, those skins would turn the blade of your sword. Oh, Gareth, Gareth, be careful. At that new tone, the lad's heart leapt within him for joy, but he had not long to consider its meaning, for the evening star was now calling to him from the bridge. O oh, brother star, why do you shine here so low? Your ward is higher up, but tell me, have you slain the maiden's champion? Then the damsel saw that he was mistaking Gareth for his brother, because he bore the morning star's shield, and cried out to him, No star of yours, but shot from Arthur's heaven with all disaster to you and yours. Both your younger brothers have gone down before this youth, and so will you, Sir Star. Are you not old? Yes, old, laughed the knight both old and hard, with the might and breath of twenty such boys. Then he blew a fierce blast on his horn, whereat, from out a storm-beaten and many-stained pavilion, came a grizzled old woman, who armed him in battered arms and brought with a helm and a drying evergreen for a crest, and a shield whose emblem was a half-tarnished evening star. Thus equipped, he leaped upon his horse, and he and Gareth hurled madly together on the bridge. Three times in that terrible struggle the lad threw his opponent, and three times he saw him rise again as strong as ever, until Gareth was panting hard, and his heart, fearing that it would now be overcome, labored within him. 
Just at this moment, however, above the din of clashing arms, he heard the voice of Lynette. "'Well done, brave knight,' she was crying. "'O oh, knave as noble as any knight, shame me not. O oh, good knight knave, strike! You are worthy of the round table. His arms are old. He trusts his hardened skin. Strike! Strike!' Then Gareth, encouraged by this unexpected praise, smote with such might that he hewed off great pieces of his enemy's armor, and at last succeeded in hurling him headlong over the bridge. Panting still, he turned to the maiden, saying, Three-fourths of my quest is now achieved, fair damsel. Ride, and I follow. But Lynette answered very, very gently, I lead no longer. You are the kingliest of all kitchen knaves. Ride at my side, I pray you. So the two rode side by side as the long summer twilight deepened about them. After a while the maiden spoke again, and all her former haughtiness had left her, so that her voice was sweet and shy. Sir, she murmured, sir, whom I would now call knight if I had not heard you call yourself a knave, I am ashamed to have treated you so discourteously. I am of noble birth, and I thought the king scorned me in mine when he assigned the quest to you. But now I humbly ask your pardon for I know that whatever may be your rank, you have a princely heart. Damsel, said Gareth gently, you are not at all to blame, except for mistrusting our good king. Know, then, that I am no kitchen knave, but the son of King Lot and Queen Bellicent of Orkney, and if I had any but a princely heart, I should shame my birth. Then they rode again for a long time in silence. After a while, Lynette spoke once more. Sir Prince, I feel that the time has come when I must warn you, but do not, I pray you, think that I speak any longer in scorn. You have fought valiantly. I doubt if Launcelot himself could have performed greater feats. But now I plead with you to turn back. You are wounded, I know, although you have not told me. Wonders you have done, miracles you cannot do. This knight who guards the castle is not a man, but a monster who calls himself knight or death. No mortal has ever seen his face uncovered or heard his voice, and his appearance is too terrible for me to describe. I beg of you to turn back and leave the achieving of this part of the quest to Launcelot, whom the dreadful one challenged. But Gareth only shook his head, and rode on, saying, This quest is mine, fair damsel, in spite of day and night and death himself. And now heavy clouds began to gather, hiding the friendly stars from their gaze, while the air took on a strange midnight chill. Presently, Lynette leaned toward Gareth and whispered in an awed voice, There. And through the gloom, Gareth perceived, standing beside what he guessed to be Castle Perilous, a huge black pavilion with a black banner trailing from its peak. In an instant, before Lynette could prevent him, he had seized a long black horn that hung nearby and blown a blast that sent a ghostly echo through the night. Then he waited, but there was no response save from the castle windows where lights began to twinkle and pale faces were seen peering out. Again he blew, and a third time. Then, at last, the great black doors of the pavilion were slowly drawn aside, and there issued forth a hideous figure in coal-black armor, seated upon a huge black horse and bearing a black shield whose emblem was a white breastbone, barren ribs, and a grinning skull. Through the dim light this frightful apparition advanced, then paused, speaking never a word. And now Gareth really believed that his last hour had come, for all things seemed to be enveloped in a cloud of nameless horror. Suddenly the great black war-horse gave an unexpected lunge forward, and those that had not closed their eyes in terror saw death reel in the saddle and drop to the ground with a mighty crash. In an instant Gareth had leaped from his own horse, and with two mighty strokes managed to split open the enemy's armor. Then out peeped the bright face of a blooming boy. Before Gareth could recover from his astonishment, the child was kneeling before him and pleading, "'Do not slay me, Sir Knight, I beg of you. My brothers, Morning Star, Noonday Sun, and Evening Star, made me dress up in this way to frighten other knights away from the Lady Lioners.' "'But my child,' asked Gareth kindly, what madness made you challenge Launcelot, the chief knight of Arthur's round table? Fair sir, they made me do that too, the boy replied, for they hated Launcelot and hoped to slay him somewhere on the stream. They never dreamed that he could pass all three bridges. Then 
Gareth gently raised the lad, bidding him to have no fear, and the two followed Lynette into the castle, where the Lady Lioners stood waiting to welcome them, and where she speedily made ready a great feast in honor of Gareth and the overthrow of death. Now some say that Prince Gareth married the Lady Lioners, while others say that he married Lynette, but however that may be, when he rode back to Arthur's hall with his bride, he found that one of the sieges of the mystic round table glowed with the letters of his name. End of section 4